Well, uh, Vishal, there's a nice saying which puts it very well that purpose of life is life full of purpose and meaning. To me, it boils down to having a regret-free life of following your own inner scorecard. And personally, to me, a successful life means A, I'm financially independent to do what I want at any point of time. And B, I get to do uh, contribute meaningfully to society, uh, which is in a way suitable to my personality traits also. So I think so. this boils down to the essence of life. Hello and welcome everyone. I am Vishal Khandelwal and I welcome you to this new episode of The 1% Show. This show is an open-ended exploration into the minds of the wisest people around to help us learn to think, invest and live each day a little better. You can learn more at vishalkhandelwal.com. My guest today is Kuntal Shah, who is a partner at Oakland Capital, co-founder at Needle.ai and a board member at Flame University. An electronics engineer by qualification, Kuntal Bai is a first-generation entrepreneur, a business leader, and a prominent value investor with three decades of experience spanning various aspects of the capital market. I look up to him as a fountain of knowledge and wisdom, especially when it comes to investing, business analysis, and the economy. I've had the uh, opportunity to learn from him and his experiences for the past few years through his various talks and presentations, and I must thank him for all his wisdom he has shared over the years. With this and no further delay, Kuntal Bhai, welcome to The 1% Show. I am so happy to talk to you today. Thank you, Vishal, for having me over. And I hope I can do enough justice to the August audience you have cultivated. Um, it's, it's well known your blogs attract some of the most learned mind in India and abroad. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a, my pleasure to be in the August company of lights of investors you have interviewed before. And I hope I do justice to your uh, audience. I'm Thank sure, you for having sure, me. Kuntal Bhai. Thanks for being here, Kuntal Bhai. I generally start my interviews asking my guests about their background and life story. Uh, but I have a slightly different question for you to start with. I remember some time back you shared with me the 12 equations of your life. And I think those were brilliant insights. Uh, so for the benefit of the audience here, I would want you to talk about those one dozen equations. Uh, well, uh, yeah, Vishal, uh, we got talking over it and these are, uh, you know, these are not my observations and I've borrowed literally from the works of giants whom I've read about and whom I've interacted. So adequate disclosures, these are not original, but I think so as a compilation, they would add value to your, uh, to your investing community. The first of the equation is anything multiplied by zero is zero. So many activities and outcomes in our life are multiplicative in the sense that they multiply over a period of time. And if your any any situation or any outcome leads to zero at the end, uh, all the past don't matter. You could make tons of money, but if you lose it in the end, doesn't matter. Secondly, happiness is a function of achievement plus aspiration divided by regrets. This is a very powerful statement because happiness is what all of us strive for. And since regret is in the denominator, one of the easiest way to increase your happiness is to lead a life of low regret. And technically, if you have no regret, it's an infinite happiness, right? So the one way to improve your happiness is to lower your regrets. Second is to aspire to have a decent amount of achievements. Conversely, the reverse is also true that disappointment is a function of expectation divided by reality. As expectations grow, in reality fails to catch up, you become victim of your image. This is what my mentor had told me. And the key to getting, uh, avoiding disappointment in life is to keep expectations within the meaningful fold. The, th the fourth equation is kinetic energy is equal to half mb square. Why this equation is important? That in this era where rate of change is accelerating, an organization or a person can use his mass or a velocity to gain competitive advantage. And velocity being exponential, the speed is of essence. And since velocity is also linked to the direction, is the direction in which your efforts are the guided matter. So be conscious of the direction and the rate of speed changes. This is a very powerful equation. The fifth one is opportunity cost is always higher than some cost. 
many of our decision in life are some cost fallacies which many of our behavioral uh, economists and scientists have spoken about and we all have fallen victim to our sunk cost at some part of time that we the fine line between perseverance and stupidity is very low and one has to be always mindful of opportunity cost next one is destruction is far swifter than construction and this applies in stock market and businesses to a large extent rome was not built in a day but hiroshima got bombed out in one day flat the next one is ebitda is not equal to cash flows many of the investors don't bother to read cash flow statement and they are focused on shortcuts like ebitda and price earning multiple which gives a very narrow and a limited twisted view of the business environment and i think so one has to avoid that the next one is roll of luck roll of luck is supreme in life and the formula of luck is joy square divided by effort if you are if your joys are very good be mindful of what efforts you have been responsible to get that and if your joy is result of some inheritance or some winning the lottery you be mindful that you are winner of some lottery next one is despair is equal is equal to suffering minus equanimity so whenever you are in moods of stress doubt self pity loathing doubt on yourself that suffering can only be handled by reminding yourself that this too shall pass next is fourth law of motion which is for investor as a whole return decreases as motion increases and this is rightly so because this interrupts compounding a wrong decision taken disrupts the compounding which brings me to the next equation which is obviously all of you know that future value is equal to present value multiplied by 1 r s to n n being the duration so what we as investors are aspiring to have long duration of growth without interruption but growth has to be accompanied by high return cancer is also growth but you don't want such undesirable growth so growth accompanied by high return is what looking for but what investor is also looking for is low risk and the triangulation of this thing happen when you are in a environment and ecosystem of win win here vishal i want to highlight is many corporates talk win win but in practice they do win lose and this was very visible in the times of covid where companies with lot of balance cash on their balance sheet refused to pay rent to their landlords or pay to their vendors and this doesn't create longevity or reput- and also causes a reputational risk and the last equation is which is very dear to me is gratitude plus high attitude is equal to permanently high altitude right attitude combined with gratitude frame of mind is what gives you right or gives you uh, deserve you do, it makes you eligible to get the success in life so these are in some uh, short equation which has stayed with me during the course of time and i hope your uh, audience will learn from them so i'm sure uh, uh, i think uh, there's a great amount of learning that you shared and couldn't have asked for a better start to this show so thank you kuntal bhai for sharing those equations i think uh, uh, let me tell you most of them have been learned from shoulders of giants and my mentors i'm sure i'm sure uh, so kuntal bhai we 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 last talked in uh, detail in 2016 when i interviewed you for the value investing almanac uh, and and it's just like 6 years ago but seems like a different time period altogether I'm sure like you have constantly done over the years you must have been a different kind of investor in 2016 than you are now. So how has your evolution been over these years? Uh, what have you picked up along this journey and what have you given up? Uh I will answer the second part of the question earlier. Um it's very easy that I've gained enough weight and lost enough hair. And also I've given up the former dress code uh, just on the personal front. Uh the two important things which have happened in 2016 is that I have become extremely choosy of company I keep. I have learned the hard way that the marriage of convenience leads to life of inconvenience and also you can't make a good deal with a bad person. Another big change which has happened to me is earlier I used to keep decision journal chronicling my logic and my emotions and my rational for taking major investments and major activities in my life. I also have started including gratitude journal which chronicles all the good things almighty has given to us so that one has a proper perspective and equanimity in life coming back to your first question what has changed for me personally is that 
while earlier i used to be driven by internal score card and what i perceived was right for me given my personality now i started incorporating legitimate feedback received from well meaning and more capable people me so as to improve my, my own journey also as i told earlier that company matters a man is known by company he keeps the second layer uh, uh, journey of this company is whom do you consider as your mentors and role models mentors are the people who help you improve your game they are the people who inst- uh, instill discipline in you and help you to weed out the noise and make you wiser so i've i've carefully chosen my mentors and my role models and role models are your typical true north who help you to really overcome all your biases and all your uh, limitations and every situation and problem that probably i'm going to face ahead in my life has been faced by far wiser people earlier thousands of years ago and it has been well documented so why not make use of it these are the three thing changes which have happened at the personal level coming back to the market it the situation since last five years has reinforced the learning i got in 2008 that macro matters because a lot of things can happen which will happen and because of interlinkages of capital market and the information flow and the way the world economy is now interlinked the uh, small events in far corners tend to have far, a far higher impact out here for example liquidity interest rates so on and so forth the transmission mechanism are not properly understood and they can have ripple effect another thing i have learned in last few years is that all it enabled businesses are not tech businesses just to prove the point a, a company delivering me food is in the business of logistics and food will it be wise to equate it with a product company delivering high profit margins and consistent cash flows that's a question which is not clear to me yet same applies for a per- company selling insurance policy is it a distributor and a retailer of financial product or it's a tech company so the verdict is not out and i think the so market has already started distinguishing between what they call deep tech and superficial tech so these are the key learnings basically since last we spoke as far as uh, what has happened great kunkul bhai so uh, uh, last 6 years have also seen the world go go through a rapid change like it has always been for the past uh, 20 25 years we have been going through a period of uh, rapid change uh, especially the last a uh, few years where things have actually uh, uh, like uh, risen exponentially and we also saw with the with what happened with the covid epidemic uh, so i i i bring back uh, uh, sir john templeton here who said that the four most dangerous words in investing are this time is different and my question to you around that is that going by what we are seeing around in the financial markets uh, technology investors behavior and asset prices is this time really different which has the answer is very loaded in your question only uh, this time is never really different because you know and i know that this time is different are the four most dangerous word in the financial history the reason is very simple that the financial markets are dealing with pricing of businesses and uh, assets businesses are run by people regulated by people assets are created by people and the pricing of those assets are set by people so people are central to what happens in the markets and the crowd psychology and the time horizon with which it acts and the narrative with which it is seduced by remains change so what i have learned is because of recency bias we learn a lot in short term quite a bit in medium term but in long term we don't learn a- anything nothing changes but yet everything is completely different in a sense and as satyana says ke those who don't remember past are condemned to repeat it also please remember that in science and in life progress is linear but in financial world it's cyclical also the brevity in financial memory is breathtaking so when you look at it what is different is this time is nothing only thing is i would say the cycles are getting more frequent they are of shorter duration than past and the amplitudes are far higher and this is very easily understandable by the logic that earlier you didn't have a countervailing mechanism from you know central bankers acting uh, intervening actively in the market to the extent of buying stocks from the market to the fact that the capital flows and and the information flows are rapid so this too has changed materially from the past cycles and are getting more pronounced but apart from that i don't think so anything has materially changed 
that's a great insight. Uh, uh, so as I understand, you've been in the markets for the last three decades. Now that's 30 long years, uh, which means you are, you must have been through multiple periods of extreme uncertainty. Uh, so what, what has given you the courage to deal well with them? Uh, and do they have some roots in your early childhood and upbringing? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the fact that I was brought up in a, mi- a middle class family with very modest upbringing has helped me to reset my expectations my risk reward framework and what constitutes right for me in a very different fashion than many of the people I encounter in my life. Your time in earth is limited and one can't base it by living somebody's opinion. So in, right from beginning, I've been surrounded by f- uh, people who've been far more knowledgeable, far more richer and far more experienced than I have. But I have not allowed their opinions to drown my inner voice because ultimately I will have to live my own life. Secondly. I have stopped sweating over small stuff in life and focusing on the big picture. One thing I I, I really feel uh, uh, what helps me to tide out over the multiple periods of extreme certainty is the uh, data. When I analyze 30 years rolling returns over multiple period, you'll be surprised, Vishal, they are almost uniform. And each of those 30 years have several ups and downs, right from wars to pandemics to you know, uh, major events of liquidity booms and busts, but yet long-term returns have been fairly stable. What has reinforced this to me is that while the volatility is guaranteed, as long as my time horizon is quite long and I'm not levered enough and my capital base is stable, I should be in a position to overcome those uncertainty and volatile times. And in fact, if I'm lucky, I could benefit and take advantage of them. The reason is market are constantly in state of uncertainty. They are always bouncing around and they tend to overshoot. And serious amount of money can be made if you can take the right decision during those periods of location. What makes great investor is not the number crunching or having a differential insight, but I think so is the ability to make good decisions in extremely uncertain time. And this, this uh, strong conviction that over a period of time, well-managed companies tend to do well and beat inflation and taxes, which is my investing goal. Uh, so helps me stand and take a call because this is this time too shall pass. That's 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 plain and simple inner intuition and voice which drives me to face this uncertain times. So, uh, uh, thirty years back, like nineteen ninety two is when when you started investing, uh, and uh, you ma- you made a mention of market cycles, which I understand is one of the most important things that an investor should understand, right? When while investing, we all talk about stock picking and asset allocation, but people uh, forget that they also need to understand where they are in the market cycle. Uh, so one great insight which I can draw from your previous uh, response uh, is that uh, 30, 30 year rolling return, right? We, again, uh, uh, long term thinking. I think that's a great insight for people who are worried about short term volatility, ignoring the fact that. Uh, in today's world, in today's time, long-term thinking and long-term investing uh, and focusing on businesses, not just stock prices, is the only edge that you have. It's not analytical edge. It's not informational edge. Everyone has the same information. People are smarter. So uh, it's not an edge, right? So the only edge I understand and from your inside as well is that's behavior, right? How you behave and how do you stick to your process uh, uh, through thick and thin and, and not really go by that fear of missing out that most people uh, get caught into. Uh, talking about market cycles, so 1992 to 2022, you've been through multiple market cycles. Uh, what in your experience are the common traits and subtle differences between these various market cycles that you've been through? So Vishal, uh, we discussed in the past when you interviewed me that financial markets are nothing but the study of cycles and human behavior with money. The cycles in markets are of multiple types. There is a monetary cycle, there is a business cycle, and there is also a cycle of liquidity and investor cycle, psychology of how we perceive all these things to per, together via feedback loops. Cycles are driven by interest rate, liquidity, psychology, and it's a, basically what boils down to is a confidence game, the degree of confidence investors enjoy in the current environment. So what I've observed is, Rising liquidity and low interest rate, coupled with a catalyst which has a seductive narrative, is usually the reason why the booms happen. And the converse side of the story is monetary tightening and rising interest rate, with narrative being taken to extreme, is a cost of bust. These cycles keep repeating again and again. And while they don't repeat exactly in a like manner, they definitely rhyme. 
to put an analogy to this uh, vishal these cycles are like sequels of successful movies like say indiana jones they all have predictable common plot narratives and usual ingredients thrown in like there is a villain there is a hero there is a heroine there is a plot of you know some rich uh, uh, to be discovered and so on and so forth they are quite predictable however the subtle difference i observe in the current cycle is that we have just experienced once in a century event which many of the investors have not experienced this has resulted into a global pandemic in an era of a globalized supply chain and trade which has been disrupted this has partially been responsible for inflation travel restrictions are still in place and because of free flowing information and capital flow what has happened is this cycles have been extremely quick to price in and as i repeated again the duration of the cycle has decreased we came out of uh, this covid related things in few months because of the liquidity and the steps taken by fed but constant the the corollary is that it has given rise to the inflation and now we are seeing the reverse fed back loop where asset prices are vulnerable to the rising interest rate this again reinforces what i said earlier is that while the because of the central banker invent, in, inventions the cycle durations have shortened and their frequency has increased so this is what i think is happening right now so continuing with uh, the insight that you shared uh, we've seen uh, that in the last few centuries of documented history of financial markets booms and busts have lasted for long periods of time and were not as frequent but due to the intervention as you mentioned of central bankers and the government what has happened is that not just the frequency of such market surges and crashes has increased but also their amplitude so what are your thoughts on this and how should an investor position himself or herself to deal with a world uh, which is changing so fast and thanks to the central bankers so we shall one has to first understand the reason why this is happening uh, every boom and bust which has happened which you mention of has rooting in a very credible catalyst so when internet came when uh, you know this um, uh, tech disruption came it was no different than what had happened when the when the cars came when the steam engine came so the catalysts were very genuine and very bona fide they the those catalysts actually changed the course of humanity forever but what happened was they were taken to extreme and lot of capital nonsense happened around it in the sense that innovators were followed by imitators and the imitators were followed by idiots and this resulted into the overshooting and undershooting of pendulum on both sides there was extremes at both sides bubbles are only perceptible after they have burst because these are the edifices which are built on excessive liquidity and and low interest rates so two things one can do as an investor if you see uh, vishal many of the market parameters are mean reverting the profit margins of companies as a percentage of gdp gdp as a percentage of market cap all those are mean reverting valuations are also mean reverting because in long period of time you can't grow at wide rates so valuation should become anchor and or primary determinant of assessing which part of the cycle you are in and if you can't figure out you will land up proning to making uh, wrong decisions one also has to clearly remember that periods of above average performance invariably leads to periods of below performance uh, below average performance having said that the best way for investor to have deal with is to create cash at the time of booms and have the cash and courage to invest it when the a company bust happens easier said than done but that's the only way uh, possible where one can really ride through the vagaries of this kind of uh, emotional roller coaster rides second thing one has to be very mindful that markets are good at factoring in the current narratives and collective wisdom of market is quite superior but at the same time quite flawed at times and it corrects one has to be ready to either have the sense of regret of missing out opportunity or seek safety once that mindset is very clear it is very easy to follow up on the subsequent issue and position yourself for the roller coaster ride you have been a student of financial history and and an ardent student right and uh, i wish uh, sometime in the future probably we can have one special session only on your lessons from financial history uh, uh, but uh, uh, 
being a student of financial history also makes you a rare breed for because uh, i've not come across many investors uh, who lay a lot of importance uh, to history in financial markets right i would like to know your thoughts on this and maybe with one or two examples of how learning from history has helped you make uh, better investment decisions in the past so uh, vishal um, uh, i have this uh, fabulous story of isaac newton right if you know he was the most intelligent person probably who uh, came to reside on earth he gave you the three laws of motion which dictates pretty much the entire physical world uh the story goes that he identified the south sea company uh, as a company of high promising potential very early and exited making lot of money and he got very rich what what happened subsequently is that many people around him got far richer than him and he couldn't stand that so he took leverage and entered the market at the top and then exited broke which led him to say that i can calculate the motion of stars and uh, uh, planets with accuracy but i can't predict the stupidity of human beings if isaac newton can't do it we should be very careful of you know our propensity to do handle this very carefully and that requires you to have a playbook booms and bust and are like you know um a uh, cleansing mechanism of the capital market and they result from consequences of consequences so i will give you two examples of where it has really helped me navigate the thing it has been very impossible for me to you know completely take a cash call but uh, you know i have been always gravitating towards larger caps when the valuations have become frothy also i've been able to take a subsequent cash calls and how does this happen i don't wait for the stock prices to reach to their potential peak which i have in mind i have a, this concept called getting foot in the door at times of selling what investor don't realizing is that buying is important but selling is an equally important decision and as soon as you have a period of frothiness where large amount of returns are made in short period of time some amount of profit taking has been occurred to keep for the rainy day so that the cash percentage keeps going up uh, this kind of tactical calls actually helps me to have cash at the subsequent downturn another thing which has uh, helped me is to portfolio construct i am a concentrated investor vishal which you know which means that i have a, a core portfolio of 5 6 concentrated names and a long tail of short uh, you know a, a, long, a small position which are almost like optionalities in 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 boom those optionalities becomes far meaningful styles of the position and that is the time comes to trim some of them so these are the two important construct i have developed the reason is very simple why this happens is because the investors of different time horizons different capital structure and risk attitude are all interacting on the same asset price and obviously all of them can't be right at that time this leads to overshooting and undershooting which one has to guard against and this is why the history of capital markets can't be understated also i have a advantage i have never studied any other business school or you know chartered accountancy come from an engineering background and i think so learning about the businesses of the past and the great investors of the past really were the two uh, pillars of my learning in the stock market so i didn't have to unlearn a lot just to probably speak i think uh, uh, probably that's great, great inspiration for a lot of people who don't come from financial backgrounds right in terms of chartered accountants your mbas but uh, who are self learners self made right who can still do it probably your stories is as inspiring as can be uh preparing for this interview i've i've been through a lot of your interviews and a lot of your other uh, lectures that you've shared in the past right and uh, i have pulled out some questions out of there because i understand that as much as i can get out of you right in this uh, one session i think uh, that'll be very less anyway so uh, probably we do another session in the future but uh, uh, one of the things which i uh, uh, read in an interview uh, some time back that you gave some time back i think uh, you mentioned that small changes in human psychology tends to produce exaggerated and amplified changes in asset prices and we i think uh, seen a lot of that in the past so just can you explain what you mean by this statement uh, vishal uh, let me give you some anecdotal data points uh, if you see the forecast of the analyst gdp forecast tend to be in the region of 1 to 2% year and there also cash flow and earning prospects of the broader market are 
maybe five five six percent off here and there. But if you really analyze the volatility around that, small changes in GDP forecast and small changes in cash flow perspective of the businesses results into extremely large movement on stock prices. Let me give you more nuanced reason. If I were to assume that the fair price of a company is future value discounted at the appropriate interest rate if i even even were to assume that company was not to make any earnings or cash flow in one year the maximum differenti- differentiation in theoretical value will be around 5 to 6% because the terminal value is what matters but in reality if you see any of the blue chip in an any given year the fluctuation between their high low is in excess of 35 to 40% so what does this imply that there are factors beyond fundamentals which are at work and i am reminded of james grant uh, uh, quote on this which i may not be able to quote perfectly but he says to suppose that the stock prices are reflective of the discounted future cash flows at appropriate interest rate and tax rate we tend to forget that in past we have burned witches we have supported uh, uh, stalin we have gone to war at whims and when george orwell said martian is landed we have believed that also so this reflect, reflects that there are factors beyond the fundamentals that work here human psychology tends to def- neglect base rate it needs it tends to neglect supply side consideration which can overnight change demand can't change overnight but supply side can change and then the narratives can change this can result into sudden disappearance of confidence and mean reversion process starts asset price being forward looking subjective assumptions these assumptions can change overnight in 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 face of an adversity and also please remember that investors have a very large number of choices there's a large number of permutation and combinations of portfolio construction when you overlay all these things on the top it becomes an extremely complexity exercise prone to disruption and changes at the first instant that's why i said that small changes in psychology tends to prove pr- produce very dramatic swings in the underlying asset price because ultimately the price of the asset is set by the human beings and it's very well known that human beings are known to go to to become mad in herds but come to senses one by one we tend to be social animals seeking comfort in collective wisdom and it is very difficult to be contrarian when the whole crowd is moving against you and that's why the psychology studies are quite important Mm-hmm. completely agree with you and uh, uh, about base rates about the fact that we uh, go mad in herd side and get back to our sensibilities individually uh, another issue which uh, i think uh, uh, i've seen investors uh, uh, get into or i've also been a culprit over there in terms of myself making that mistake is that we tend to work around certainties we tend to work around predictions and not probabilities right despite Uh, there being enough evidence that investing is a game of probabilities and that success depends on bringing the odds in your favor now there is a thin line uh, between anticipating the future events and assigning probabilities and possibilities versus predicting future events so how do you try and stay ahead of the curve on this front very interesting question so vishal as an engineer i know that anticipation of events is all about examining a wide range of outcomes now many things will happen can happen but will not happen sorry so having a wide range of outcomes in your decision making and choice architecture is the first requirement second then it boils down to is assigning probability which means you weigh them and you determine the odds of them happening the prediction around the bit around it is a for forming a definitive view about what is likely to happen here the trick is very simple i have four filters to uh, examine first is the range of outcomes probability associated with them what is the impact of each of those outcomes and what is the frequency or uh, of those happening probability and odds times the likelihood of that happening is the expected value of that incident happening or the uh, or the asset price happening so what happens is the current asset prices are collective reflection of the stock market participants of varying profiles this is very interactive it's very probabilistic and it's very noisy 
so value investing essentially boils down to examining the broad range of outcomes assessing the probabilities associated with it but here i was helped by this brilliant book which i urge all of you to read from St- stephen pinman i think so it's called accounting for value where he clearly ha- taught me that as an investor and i'm always negotiating with mr market but onus is not on me to come up with a fair valuation the valuation is already told to me by the current prices and it is my job to understand what are the embedded expectations in that valuation and whether to accept or reject the bid offer price quoted by the mr market i think so M- M- michael mobison has also written a f- fabulous book on this called expected um, um, expectation investing i think so where the the right framework is not to have a view on the range of valuation of the asset price but to reverse work the current expectation embedded in the current valuation and take a call whether it meets your needs or not i think so this uh, turns the whole investing culture on its head but at the same time this is not a one time exercise you keep updating view as more and more confirming or disconfirming evidence comes by we shall one thing as investor is beliefs are supposed to be loosely held and all the hypotheses and all the confirmations which you have are meant to be stress tested they are not treasures to be cherished and protected so one needs a, f- a flexibility and agile view if you do these two things right i think so you will land up ahead of the curve oh uh, that's a great insight uh, kuntal bhai and and the more i listen to you the more i realize our house stupid i have been all these years uh, and how like uh, uh, it's a great uh, thing like sitting in front uh, of you and talking to you right Vish- Vish- uh, Vish- learning those Vish- lessons <laughs> Vishal, if you were to read my book on Hall of Mistakes, uh, you would refuse to take my interview. <laughs> no, no, we all through this journey, right? Some more, some less, but we are all through this, right? Uh, the the important thing is to realize the mistakes that we make and made, right? And to create that yeah, so Hall we, of we, Shame. <laughs> Vishal, uh, mistakes are given in our business. Nobody can make all the decisions, right? And as George Soros has said. it is what you lose when you are wrong that matters and what you win when you are right that matters but everybody gets a lot of things wrong and you are aware of acts of commission and omission and we can't brow ourselves to debt by you know past it's inevitable that's a part of the investing journey that's and i also take solace from that uh, quote that someone said that uh, there are no mistakes there are only lessons yeah right so yeah. <laughs> great uh, uh i was reading another interview you gave in 2019 uh, where you said and i quote early in my career luck played a lesser role and skill played a bigger role but now one has to be luckier the current investment process is all about elimination of what not to do i think i know what you were trying to say here but i would like you to expound on the same mm-hmm. uh, and also what are those things an investor must eliminate or avoid doing to generate a good investment track record over years Vishal, the answer lies in what you said in the past that we, as an investor, have three kind of edges. One is informational, where you know you uh, tend to process large amount of information, and currently because of technology boom, information uh, which was earlier in short supply has become and torrent, and it's in fact now we have to think about how to filter out the information. It's no longer an edge. Filtering the information is definitely an edge. Second is analytical. again thanks to the technology and the uh, uh, general skill sets level of the investing population has improved more and more smart people have entered the market and as the base rate of investing population becomes more and more intelligent both your information and analytical edges have eroded away then what is left it's a behavioral age technology has resulted in democratizing uh, democratizing information and if you were to only stick by information and analytical age the law of diminishing return kicks in then what is it left behavioral so there are two two things at work here and i would like to say what peter kaufman had said he was asked this question ke what explains success and he said that skills contribute to 7% or so of the man's uh, success courage is some some 26 27% and the rest is luck why luck because when large number of investing population is as skilled as you are then skill is no longer the f- function of your outperformance its behavior its luck and why behavior leads to luck is it's very counterintuitive the harder i work the luckier i get 
it's a reverse feedback at loop that if i make efforts i tend to uh, get exposed to the right idea and and that leads to me right outcome luck and risk are the same side of the coin but we treat them very differently vishal uh, we i've heard a lot of institutional investors say uh, risk adjusted return but i have not heard anybody says return adjusted for luck so far and there is lies the thing that uh, financial markets are a uh, great teacher but they send expensive bills and i paid my bills i think that uh, concept of luck adjusted return i think that's that's a wonderful insight uh, uh, and i'm sure uh, uh, luck is one of the most important uh, factors in uh, investors surviving over the long term right but in uh, fact vishal uh, vishal i remember a story of napoleon so when napoleon used to analyze which general would fight the battles he would examine them he would question them he would see their you know skill sets but he would ask who's the lucky one what he meant is you know who uh, who's the luckier one given the 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 hard work put in and and the probability of winning so uh, i think so that that continues that luck favors courageous and prepared that's right that's right. and so whether they are uh, uh, generals or investors i think uh, luck is what really helps us survive over the long period of time of course there's some element of skill but uh, i'm sure luck plays a good enough role even over the long term uh, talking about luck uh, one of the best uh, investor interviews i have come across is the one where jason zweig interviews peter bernstein in which uh, uh, peter bernstein said that the only road to riches is through survival and like buffett also says that to finish first you must first finish well, all sir. this is known and proven for decades now so why do you think most investors chase multi baggers when the key to sound investing lies in avoiding blowouts so uh, uh, vishal this is one of this counter intuitive things which works in market most of the investors want to have superior returns what it does is it makes them orient towards returns only and to the peril that they pay very little attention to the risk involved in attaining tame many of the investors have not read about charles jacobi who had said invert always invert and i think so charlie munger has also profounded that some of the most complex problem in life cannot be solved forward but you need a twin track analysis of you know forward and backward where you have to invert the whole situation and peter bevlin also has written this wonderful book tell me where i'm going to die and i will not reach it i think so it's a funded rule book and i uh, i urge all the investors to read it also one of the success factor is you can't be focused on what to do all the time equal attention has to be paid to what not to do this failure to do this train track analysis is the reason why investors are constantly looking at upside but are oblivious to downside risk the way to prevent this is to do pre or pre mortem you assume your investment hypothesis will not work out and work backwards okay, what could be the reason why the investment hypothesis would not work out and that will make you more alert investor and will change your hypothesis more importantly you will be alert to the rapid signs of what could be faulty hypothesis basically what i'm trying to say is that aggression of getting return has to be balanced by conservatism of protecting the capital and that requires you to handle this contradictory topics and it requires a first man mind investors by large i've seen a risk seeking attitude in good times and their attitude reverses during the bad time where they actually become risk averse where in reality they should be doing exactly opposite also i think so the successes of stories of large hedge fund and venture capital investors and all creates a kind of fomo uh, people start focusing on tail events and power laws and all this makes them sharply focus on multi bagger where actually the key to successful is to ensure that you don't have uh, large blowouts because capital preservation and the long term compounding is a surest way to attaining uh, your financial security mm mm-hmm. what about the underlying risk of investing in a business right so uh, we've talked about uh, the behavior of investors we've talked about how we make mistakes as or the problems that we get into while uh, not behaving well as investors right and not understanding what the real risk of investing is but what about the risks to businesses uh, uh, that you're looking at which include uh, say uh, moats which deteriorate or valuations which go haywire how do you think about risk apart from the general definition of having permanent loss of capital 
and uh, how do you employ that mindset of keeping risk low in your investing vika uh, vishal risk is a multifaceted hydra business face many risk risk of funding risk of disruption risk of competition risk of regulations uh there's a huge number of risk which a business per se faces overlay on top of that the risk of management taking wrong capital allocation calls management doing something stupid and um, all kind of frauds which happens then there is a valuation risk risk of overpaying for good companies so the whole investing thing is not about return maximizing it is about eliminating each of this risk also risk is never a number it's a safety valve for the ecosystem where you actually have to have a checklist against risk because an investor has very limited understanding of most of the aspects and many a time they land up accepting risk without getting compensated to do so second worry from investor perspective is over quantification uh we have large number of uh, theories on uh, uh, ex- uh, ex- uh, employing exert ex- calculus but the, the the biggest problem i face is risk is about losing capital let me rephrase this question I, I, there are four stages of risk first is some of the risk can be eliminated let me give you the example of what kind of risk which can be eliminated the risk which can be eliminated is you know concentration you can have a sufficiently diversified portfolio but not overly diversified portfolio so as to have superior returns another risk which can be uh, diversified away is size and liquidity all these things can be done up front but many of the risks can not be eliminated but you have to be careful enough while at the driving seat to be alert to them and mitigate them as and when they arise such as risk of capital misallocation such as risk of overvaluation such as risk of adverse regulation so it's a it's a twin track again analysis that certain risk can be addressed upfront by your processes and portfolio construct but certain risk can be only mitigated as and when they evolve also i think so most of the new financial innovation embed some kind of leverage or risk but both are many times perceived advantages by investors and i think so th- this needs to be avoided the standard uh, competitive uh, uh, edge disappearing the porters five from framework turning adverse to you value migration are all well known but what is not known is that you need to be compensated to take the risk even the best of the companies when bought at very sky high price tend to be a risky asset and even the sometimes worst of the companies bought at a throwaway price can end up giving you um, multi bagger so this valuation is also one filter against risk cash allocation is also a filter against risk and these are within the hands of the investor mm-hmm. what about value drivers right so uh, in in the long term uh, businesses uh, that create value or wealth for shareholders have certain drivers to create that value right and uh, in your insight in your experience as a business analyst over the past 3 decades now uh, what are those value drivers you look for in a business uh, and if you can give some tangible cases of using the same in your analysis and approach uh, very interesting question so by and large investing communities focused on companies which generate healthy free, free cash flows on a consistent basis compounding equation being longevity of growth and high returns uh, obviously companies which deliver this tend to enjoy investor benefit and are highly valued in capital markets another way is you know growing earnings with no cash flow but they are redeploying in future to generate growth at high returns without too much dilution this is also a, a growth investing which is quite popular with investors there are two important other sources of value drivers which are many times ignored by the capital market one of them is companies which are repositioning assets to a greater use and let me give you an example that if your company was generating inadequate returns in the past but is now chosen to repossess the purpose assets to a greater use through a corporate restructuring or mna or you know return of capital i think so that 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 can be also also source of generating good returns last and what is not obviously talked about at many time and i haven't come across literature 
uh, which deals with it is you know companies which enjoy access to capital market at favorable terms tend to create lot of significant value for their investor and many investors come back to me but if you raise money at high valuation your return on capital employed drops and you can't fight the cash flows and so on and so forth but let me give you an example say you are a retailer and you raise money at extremely high uh, valuation you can do two things you can buy the properties and own the properties and save on rent which expands your margin and stay in power or you can set up franchises by giving them loans to set up the franchises and collect both higher sales or royalty or interest income uh, through loans and both improves your cash flows so also many a times companies have excess capital market resulting into lower dilution for the remaining shareholders and created uh, that capital raised into a superior competitive advantage because they have used that as a currency to acquire business or further their goals so these two sources of you know uh, value drivers are by and large uh, ignored by investors and even i used to fall prey to that that at times when my stocks used to get overvalued i used to sell them without realizing that the fact that as the company scale they change the orbits the liquidity improves and they attract investors with lower return expectation than me which would lead them to a much higher valuation for a longer period of time than i was ready to pay for another thing is people ignore investors are economic social and political and financial system in which business operates it also is huge bearing on its success and failure with this in mind what i have learned is you know i tend to underweight companies in early stage of life where failure rate is highest also i am on watch out for companies with inability to cannibalize the existing product because that is the achilles heel of many of the successful business which are generating healthy cash flows they are so enamored by cash flow they don't take small experiments and they fail to innovate dependence on patronage political connection or illegal illegal gratification is also a source of value at times but i don't think so it's a sustainable in long run so i tend to avoid it also one has to be aware of abcd of culture arrogance bureaucracy culture decay so on and so forth because as firms expand and it attracts more talent the culture of the firm is something which can change dramatically and obviously management getting defocused or burn out and all those kind of thing so these are the value drivers and you can use them to be alert to create value for yourself mm-hmm. we we talked about mistake we touched upon mistakes some time back uh, and uh, as investors and decision makers we all we all make a lot of them uh, some more some less as i mentioned i'm sure you have made your back full of investing mistakes and you we actually wrote a paper called the hall of shame or something like that right so when you look back at your bag of mistakes uh, which which has been the most memorable one that led you to a valuable lesson that helped you later in life so <laughs> vishal when i completed two decades in investing i actually wrote out a paper called max mia kalpa means my biggest mistakes you know where i actually chronicled all the biggest mistake i done in two years and the footnote of that article said is that um when i come back to you after 30 years the list is going to be longer but hopefully those would be the mistakes of newer varieties not the old ones and that's that's a uh, given as i said mistakes in our business is given so the common mistakes which had happened in the earlier part of my investing career was you know first was premature selling i would sell for wrong reasons and that reason could include you know promoters have sold some shares or valuation has gone haywire the corrective action which i have realized over a period of time is every investment of mine has a buy zone a hold zone and a sell zone and the hold zone is one of the longest because please remember that when you find good investment whose hypothesis you understand whose value drivers you understand whose management you like and which management is delivering those kind of companies are very red breed only 4 or 5% of entire investable universe creates value and of that a small fraction creates superlative inflation and if you were to just end up selling them uh, because of uh, temporary overvaluation you would give up the longevity of compounding which follows 
and i think so that mistake i had done multiple times over where i bought excellent businesses at very defensible price but got out too early and then they became 50 60x afterwards and i could never re enter them again which leads to me the second thing i used to just once i buy, buy, used to buy the share i used to get anchored around the price and what would happen is i could never buy it again as the management delivers what now i've changed is i've developed a philosophy called foot in the door both at the time of buying and by selling i have no calms in averaging up as the hypothesis plays out as the management delivers and as the market starts recognizing the that something is credible is happening in the company and the same happens at the time of selling that you tend to sell some but not all so that you are not anchored to the price the third aspect is on the portfolio construction uh in my early journey i used to put almost 90% of my capital in top 5 6 ideas and remaining used to be cash uh that would also result that i would do very deep studies on those companies but i would lose the breath what has now started happening is now i tend to also be concentrated but i now have a long tail where 20 to 30% of my portfolio is also on you know optionality kind of trade where i don't tend to lose too much money but but many of those optionality trade at some point of time could deliver and become the core part of the portfolio also i have realized that the biggest problem comes from my psychology so it's not i'm 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 more focused on not getting analytical and information age but but focusing on the behavioral age and this are the this are the clear things i'm doing to do it uh i can give you uh, vishal uh some of the mistakes uh, the acts of commissions have, are not not com- acts of commission are visible on my balance sheet but acts of omission are not and if i were to aggregate even if i had put and retain those shares uh, i would have my uh, my uh, orbit uh, would have been different so they really hurt and uh, i had compounded those stupidities many time over in last two two decades of journey and hopefully i think so i have learned from it that suits my nerves because <laughs> uh, i have enough uh, number of such omissions so i, I think uh, hearing you out hearing uh, 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 such a wise investor in front of me talking about mistakes and uh, the fact that the orbit could have been something different i think that that is relieving so thanks for sharing all that uh, my next question is about the idea of non linearity uh, which is a very hard concept to grasp uh, so So in investing we talk about the idea of developing an exponential growth mindset uh, but uh, like we saw in the covid pandemic right and it again proved the widespread inability of even the best decision makers including policy makers at the highest levels to grasp this basic idea of exponential growth so as a student of human behavior how does that surprise you uh, as an ardent student of human behavior what what have we learned about how does one go about developing such a mindset that is so important while investing and also while just living in a world that seems to be changing exponentially a great question so vishal all of us are aware of compounding equations uh, all of us are aware of uh, significance of tail events and how getting those few decisions right can change your orbit but what is not clearly visible is you know our horizons tend to be extremely short term many of the politicians and regulators many of the businessmen and many of the investor have extremely short term horizons and by definition if you have short term horizon you land up disturbing compounding equation thirdly secondly sorry many of the incentives are misplaced so if you have allocated your money to a professional fund manager who's constantly valued on short term time horizon you are actually indicating him to act short term and this action of your portfolio manager against uh, breaks down your comp- compounding and obviously the last question is moral hazard where you know uh, people in decision making be it regulator or be it comp- uh, you know uh, whoever it is would not like to be held accountable for something going wrong and it's easy to pass the buck when you combine all these factors uh, it's no wonder that do we understand what is exponential and how it helps us in diffi- in 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 reality it's extremely difficult to implement and as a student of human behavior you know anything which is short term oriented one needs to filter out by 
visualizing will this matter so it could it could even be in you know compounding of a relationship the the question to ask is will this person matter to you after 10 years will he be around to challenge you and make you a better person same thing goes for almost anything which is long term that mismatch of time horizon incentives and you know uh moral hazardness creates all this kind of uh, funny outcomes and one has to guard against uh, this consequences of consequences thinking long term i think that idea of zooming out uh, is such an important insight uh, uh, i learned it late but i think uh, couldn't agree more with you that uh, if, the idea of com- looking at compounding from a long term perspective right actually living through it and not just talking about that i think that's that's a great insight uh, uh, talking about behavioral finance we've talked about some uh, ideas that you have to share about how people behave and how we have be- be- behaved as investors so you've been a practitioner of behavioral finance you've also been a teacher of behavioral finance so how can you as, as specifically as a teacher try to chip uh, uh, away at the biggest problem uh, in investing which is the problem of how people behave as investors Uh, and here i would love to hear tangible examples of things that you have done or the systems that you have set up for yourself to stop making or to minimize uh, uh, those stupid common mistakes that we all make as investors very interesting question part of which we have dealt earlier but uh, let me start one thing is you know uh, for compounding to work your holding period has to be long right but two things are happening the rate of change has picked up dramatically because of ease of availability of capital technological changes new business model and if you don't factor uh, this rate of change in your underlying businesses then your there could be a holding period mismatch um, let me tell you uh, if you are a vc investor uh, investing in non profitable startup which are spending huge amount of money in customer acquisition cost you better have a long term horizon right because uh, because that's the only way it works but if you are suppose a secondary market investor and, and you are holding a company where the rate of change has exploded dramatically you have to be alert to a discontinuation of your initial hypothesis right it's a it's a duality of this forces at work when you when you consider uh, the problem of investing how do you deal with it i i told you that first you need to keep decision journals human mind is not a rational animal but it's a rationalizing animal and though uh, the finance theory assumes that we are a logical engine but in reality we are a analogy engine driven by narratives and aesthetics and we are a self correcting action engine and how do we correct our uh, selves it's only by documenting our processes and revisit them at the times of dislocation another good exercise to improve your result is to have devil's advocate or a 10th man in your system who forces you to challenge the conventional wisdom in a very calm and comfortable environment so that you legitimize the doubt up front it's a safe place to gather this confirming evidence rather than keep continuously gathering confirming evidence also one has to learn to bundle the contradictions uh so investing requires you to believe in your view and your hypothesis that you are right but at the same time it requires you to have a humility that collective market could be right and you could be wrong also portfolio needs to be diversified enough to prevent blow outs but it at the same time it needs to be concentrated enough so that it moves the needle and your portfolio doesn't what you had written i think so earlier was it doesn't re- resemble like a warehouse but it resembles like a curated museum also you have to balance momentum with regression to mean so what basically it entails is sometimes you have to take the helicopter view and see amazon for forest it is but there sometimes you will have to do bottoms up picking where you have to hug the tree and see which of them is in fight uh, um, infested by termite so this kind of dual thinking twin track analysis is the only way you can chip away at the biggest problems in investing Uh, uh the biggest problem i see right uh, you you talked about independent thinking the biggest problem that i see all around is that we are too much dependent or we have started getting too much dependent on technology right and uh, uh, what the machine tells us or what the artificial intelligence tells us right so here i want to bring uh, uh, what the noted uh, uh, american entrepreneur and software engineer mark andreessen has said and he said and i quote that software is literally eating the world So if you agree with him uh, how does one as a decision maker and not just an investing as a general decision maker 
safeguard human judgment that risks getting replaced by artificial intelligence or machines well vishal uh, i've reflected over this issue uh, myself because of my uh a startup which uh, i'm running which is uh, which is uh, on the ai space and here's my view uh, uh based on what i know of technology as it stands today i don't think it's likely to replace human beings in decision making in near future currently as the technology stands it is highly prone to over and underfeed the data it in fact recognizes patterns when none exist it doesn't have context and intuition also it can't weigh probabilities odds impact frequencies and a lot of psychological reactions via feedback loops so to to in short uh, what the since the stock markets and the capital markets are driven by uh, humans regulated by humans and uh, underlying business and assets which it represents are human centric and since the decision making of humans is largely driven by biases heuristics and bouts of fear greed and stupidity technology is unlikely to uh, understand humans though humans can understand the technology what i think today is technology will enhance humans cognition by allowing us to process incrementally larger amount, amount of data newer data sets more number crunching improved productivity and technology has an amazing role to play to be our system of records where we can store and retrieve large amount of data at a click of button system of processing where we can manipulate and slice the data and dice the data and draw inferences and also a system of collaboration where you know we can share uh with data with our ecosystem colleagues and clients very easily but it is unlikely to be a system of decision making on its own and look no further avishal technology as it stands today is even struggling to recognize fake data propagandas and dubious and pirated content also please understand that market participants are smart and they quickly adapt to new realities but for machine to get that level of smartness it will require tweaking or altogether a new algorithm which again only humans can design so uh, in short i think the technology is going to be a wonderful companion to humans it will enable them to process large amount of data keep getting better at information and analytical edges but however it will fall far short on behavioral side and decision making in time to come that's that's a view i hope so today yeah, yeah. i hope it does because uh, i think uh, there has been a general concern every now and then the how about technology uh, uh, becoming uh, 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 like so big and like so powerful that one day probably destroys humanity probably we are not in that stage as of now we are not talking about what they call that singularity right where technology advances to mm-hmm. become better and more intelligent so heartening to know your view over there like uh, being an onlooker uh, ardent onlooker on, on in this space uh, the kind of work that you are doing yourself on the ai front we're going to talk about that uh, uh, before that uh, uh, i want to uh, uh, change the trajectory a bit and uh, uh, so this 1% show the idea of the 1% show is not just about investing and uh, principles investing right but it's also the, the bigger purpose that i have with the show is to help the youngsters the young people right who are getting to the careers who are maybe as investors or otherwise as well uh to when they're starting on their compounding journey that 1% compounding journey to have the right insights right of course we all learn by experiences uh, we all learn by faltering ourselves and not just uh, by listening to others and learning from other people's experiences but i think uh, 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 that's one of the most important questions that i ask people and i uh, uh, look forward to the insights when they share lessons for youngsters young adults when they're starting out their journey you sh- you love sharing lessons you've done that uh, for the past many years now So my next question to you is about the most important uh, lessons from your experience uh, uh, which a young person must practice to break into and succeed in finance. Uh, I'll come to general uh, work as well but uh, uh, what about someone who wants to get into finance? Uh, uh, what do you know about uh, your chosen field of finance that you wish you knew when you were first starting out 3 decades ago probably because that advice could be helpful for someone who's just starting out now. So uh Vishal if you as you as you are aware I started with a clean slate I I was an engineer with no experience on financial side or the business side entering into stock market and I had to uh, uh learn the things hard way and if I were to relook at it my business and what I would have uh, wished I knew when I was 22 uh 
Incidentally, there's a book by Tina Sally called What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20 and I urge all the young guys to read it. It's a very brilliant book worth reading and I'm copying it to an extent. What I would wish I had known before was that being an engineer, uh, one was very scientific, one was very precise, one was very numerate, one was very precision-seeking uh, mindset. But the way the world works, the way the businesses are run and the way people work can be only learned by developing mental models which can be built only upon multidisciplinary learnings drawn from diverse sets of uh, field and literature. Uh, this was one thing which was not explained to us at that point of time and we had to learn it the hard way and we have paid a high price of those learning. Secondly, the business of finances, the business of cycles and how human psychology interacts with money. And for that, we needed to learn the role of cycle and the role of finance history. And in fact, it was very late during the day I, I learned about cycles through wonderful works of people like Edward Chancellor, who has written this book, Capital Returns and Capital Asset at Marathon, where, where he talks about long-term cycle and uh, long-term uh, books of financial histories from authors like, uh, again, Edward Chancellor's in Devil Takes Handum and Sight and Mania's Panics and Crash and so on and so forth. So I think though, these two things, if I had learned at the onset, that would have really shortened my learning curve and lessened my uh, learning bill. What I want to leave away with your audience is that to assume that a value of a common stock is determined purely by corporation is its cash flow discounted by appropriate interest rate and marginal tax rate is to forget that we as human beings have burned witches, gone to war and uh, have even believed that Martians have landed so as to speak about James Grant. This highlights that investor A needs to be multidisciplinary and have contradictory skill sets and opinion. A healthy dose of skepticism is required and also avoidance of blind contrarianism. Hence, the biggest mistake I think so we as a young student should understand is that you shouldn't believe that what is happening in the recent past is likely to persist going ahead. If this was one lesson, this would be it that markets will surprise you on odds on that account. I think that's a great lesson. I think uh, like all the fundamental forces that we are surrounded with, right, uh, uh, as far as physics is concerned, uh, 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 even within investing, I think my experience uh, and looking at the experience of others uh, tells me that there are fundamental forces acting upon us, right? Things like luck, things like uncertainty, things like surprises. The more we ignore them, the more bigger mistakes we are going to fall into, or bigger traps we are going to fall into. So I think your insight of uh, uh, believing that there's uncertainty, uh, not starting uh, with certainties, I think is a great Idea. I, I think so. I, I think so. There's a nice saying which says that seeds of chaos are planted during the times of calm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We we've been through a a, a period of chaos, right? Uh, that was the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, we've all suffered in some way or the other, right? Physically, mentally, emotionally, financially as well. Uh, but there have been people who have survived. I, I'm sure there have been a lot of lessons that we take out from what we've been through in the last two, two and a half years. What has been your biggest lesson from the COVID pandemic, both in terms of life and how you look at the world out there? Uh, what has changed for you in the post-COVID world from the pre-COVID world? Though we are not really in a post-COVID world, we are still going through the pandemic, right? But what has, what, how, how has the pandemic changed your outlook towards life and living? Yep. Um, uh, the biggest lesson of COVID pandemic for me is, you know, it has debunked all those optimization theories where capital had to be optimized, business has to be optimized just in time, uh, hire and fire policies and so on and so forth. I think so the era of optimization had its drawback and COVID has put a spotlight on it. In fact, COVID has reinforced that survival is the biggest desirable uh, characteristic of a business rather than optimization. This has profound impact on how investors and 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 um, uh, businesses will have to factor this in how they conduct themselves. Second biggest trend I've seen is, you know, it has accelerated the trend towards digitization. Because in no other past pandemic was the world still connected like we had in this COVID pandemic. 
and also the science is responded very well by coming out with large numbers of vaccine alternatives in clear pause of time so i think the the technology has accelerated and what could have taken years to accomplish was accomplished in months people reoriented their workflows and habits and and adapted this resulted in one thing at economics and business level is that strong businesses which were run with clean balance sheet and clean management e- emerged stronger in a environment which was weakened competitively because businesses which were fragile got taken out the offshoot of this is word resilience has entered lexicon of corporates and i've heard a business leader say which has stuck to me is that you can play offense only if your defense permits it this is a brilliant statement for this to happen one has to realize that both corporates and regulators have to talk win win instead of practicing win lose kind of a situation also what is uh, what is visible right now to me is that there were policy errors uh, i think so personally uh, we have had a to lose a monetary policy and to lose an interest rate and usually the tightening of interest rate at fed always results into a financial event which i think so is unfolding even this time on a personal front uh, anti fragility and reprioritization of relationship came to the focus what one wants to achieve and do with his life and one wants to spend the time uh, reoriented change and the priorities got rewritten health friends family relationship took priority over business success and so on so forth also role of building margin of safety and buffers in your day to day affairs so the journey becomes more enjoyable and you finish the journey was highlighted by this covid pandemic completely agree with you on this on this yeah uh my next question is about peter thiel's 0 to 1 a wonderful book and uh, uh, there's this uh, favorite interview question that he often asks right and the question is what important truth do very few people agree with you on so my question to you is the same what important investing truth do very few people or very few investors agree with you on well vishal this is a very loaded question and controversial too because a it requires you to have a view and your view needs to be differential than the large uh, uh, swath of population and also you need courage to speak up one thing i do uh, was reflecting upon on this question because i heard this question being asked in many uh, recruitment interview is that truth is relative uh, and to prove this i done a thought experiment uh, in fact if you if 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 uh, what i know for sure uh, i think so is that peter thiel went on to explain that one of the answer he had was that world at large is defined by globalization is what the world thinks but the truth is technology matters most what i did was i reframed this question very differently and asked many of the young students whom i teach is what is more important for the progress of humanity in first set of students i asked them globalization or technology and most of them responded technology nobody voted for globalization and when i gave them no other option they came up with answers like geopolitics climate change disruption caused by regulators technology and so forth globalization never even turned up so what peter thiel was probably was looking for is his version of truth not absolute truth and there's nothing known as absolute truth it's all relative concept and 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 you would agree they are agree, very relative concept because there is a frame of reference and there is galilean relativity matter in answering such deep question now coming back to the investing truth uh i think so there are many uh if you look at what is thought right set to the inception when person is studying about finance and investing is that all these fancy theories like efficient market hypothesis capm uh gaussian kapula value at risk uh, modern portfolio theory all of which assumes that markets are rational and human beings which operate in markets are rational but the truth is people are anything but rational they are highly rational i could go on and on uh many of the market participants feel that you have to take lot of risk to earn high rewards but nothing could be further from truth in fact if returns were good those underlying asset would not be risky at all in first place it's counterintuitive 
uh, thirdly what i feel is uh, in 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 investing world there is a lot of nuttiness uh, and there are many ways to skin the cat and what is true for one can be poison for other so since uh, again i repeated this thing that everybody of us has a different question paper so answer has to be different so same applies to truth my truth is 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 related to me it's not related to you and one has to live and die by one's inner voice and one's inner truth uh so kuntal bhai you've been a teacher for long and you also on the board uh, uh, of flame university and you you've seen formal education with very clo- close uh, eyes right now in a world where the pace of change is multiplying uh, even as a formal education system seems insufficient largely to teach all that is required to thrive what's your advice to students and young adults in self educating themselves you have been a self learner all your life right so what's your advice what are those uh, key work and life skills that they must learn and hone to do well in this century i think so young adults and students who are inclined towards finance and well being in general should learn about good productivity hacks from people who have cracked it and make them personally productive uh, some of the examples i could uh, give you is carol dweck on growth mindset ego is enemy by ryan holiday uh, grit by angela duckworth talent code by Co- Del- Den- daniel coyle atomic habits by james clear the compound effect by darren hardy also the old classics like power of positive thinking by norman vincent pale and how to win and friends and influence people by del carnegie carl newport's works on deep work and focused work uh, david allen's work on uh, getting things done tim ferris work on tools of titan and tribes of mentors so on and so forth i think so all these books are good self help and self improvement books uh they should also study books on right ethics and culture i think so military leadership and sports teaches you right there's books by uh um uh, ebers of uh, uh, it's my ship carolina bay by, uh, by uh, i forget the name of the author is another great book works of peter bevlin and uh, charlie munger on culture and right ethics are also good i would also urge them to read business biographies and read and draw infer- inferences of from books of what cause those famous people to have extreme success and failures in their life and i would be uh, m- mindful of highlighting that though success is very seductive the critical learnings are from failures because human minds is far more adaptable at learning of what not to do rather than what to do but in reality we keep chasing what to do instead of what not to do which we have discussed earlier also from financial market view point i think so the three critical components to learn is to how businesses compete and strategize how financial markets work work and history how prices move which is a psychological and how risk evolve there are books on them written by various uh, people uh, uh, which can be read upon on risk i would particularly like to um, risk and financial history i would suggest some books devil takes hindermost by ed chancellor is one book which comes to my mind books by charles mckay uh, extraordinary popular delusion and madness of crowd comes to mind incidentally there is a story about it this guy was a famous historian and okay he chronicled the entire railway mania but you know vishal he lost a bundle <laughs> in speculating on charles on on the railway stock so easier said than done it's easier to write great books but very difficult to follow the advice the works of hyman minsky um on stabilizing an unstable economy and uh and yeah bendert mandel brought on misbehavior of market is fantastic book uh, galbraith on short history of financial euphoria is a book i would uh, recommend and also uh, the books of uh, charles kindleberger where he talks about framework of you know how the bubbles evolve and how they bust are are good book um, obviously the books of uh, peter kaufman the writings of peter kaufman and peter bevlin are good recommended reading also personally to succeed in business i think so they should la- la- inculcate habit of reading the annual reports accounting footnotes and uh, try to take advantage of market by creating the right frameworks in investing which are well talked by reading books like investment checklist manifesto and so on and so forth there's a long list of books but this these are the uppermost which comes to my mind as of now 
I'm sure I think the way you've outlined the the list right I think uh, uh, tells me how voracious a reader you are uh, uh I see a lot of people reading a lot right uh, uh, but given your experience on reading I want to like ask you a question on reading right you uh, given all the responsibilities that you have in running a business running your investment taking care of investments family friends and everything you still take out time to read is there a way to read effectively that you've practiced uh, that really brings you uh, like the most bang for the buck i'm not saying like skimming through chapters and books just for the sake of it but i'm sure there is a way that you've practiced that really helps you become a more effective reader and learner and remember those things that you've learned from all these books that you've talked about yeah so th- there's an author called mortimer adler who has written a classic book how to read a book the classic guide to intelligent reading i would urge all of you to read and i benefited from that uh one a few hacks which help me to make most of my reading is making notes so there are three four ways to make notes zettel kasten way of making notes cornell notes guided notes whatever suits you you but you start making notes in a very structured manner so you can connect dots that's the first hack second hack is you know classics are always worth rereading with passage of time because every time you reread it you re re introspect and that self reflection brings out hidden nuances which you missed in the first time one more important thing forgotten about uh reading is you know reading is a conversation between you and the author where bulk of the heavy lifting which is thinking is done by the author so if you were to uh, shrink up large amount of reading in short amount of time it's very unlikely that you would draw inferences and 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 uh, take away from that so the way i've developed is you know take constant break reflect so i spread out the reading of a book over a longer period of time instead of finishing the book which i used to do earlier last is you know filter against reading bad books which i think so are intellectually poison and they destroy my 90% of the books fail to add any value over a long period of time so one needs to have a well defined way of what one wants to read and that is a very individual choice but i think so these are the things which comes to mind in you know re- effective reading and making making sense out of it sure thanks thanks for sharing all that learning i think uh, the the rule of inversion that you talked about investing i think you know, as as you mentioned also applies to reading knowing it applies to all the areas of life yeah, it, it yeah, applies yeah. to all, yeah. all the areas of life sure 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 coming to the thing that it, i think is uh, close to your heart as of now needle needle.ai uh, the latest stage in your career right so uh, talk us through uh, uh, what needle is all about and how you came up with this idea and how, what kind of problem you're trying to solve with this so vishal since i've been working as an investment professional for three decades and as i mentioned earlier information was an edge but now information is by torrent and it is a constant struggle to keep up with incremental information the information is flowing towards us in a furious manner so i agree with mark anderson when he said that software is eating the world and the second order consequences of that impact is that you know uh, as the computing power uh, increases as the storage capacity increases as and as the transmission capacity increases which is governed by moore's law crider's law and butter's law what has happened is you know the data has exploded in terms of volumes velocity variety and most importantly it is residing in multiple venues so today when i look at it i have large amount of streaming data con- residing in various silos which is for me was proving to be extremely hard to find process and collaborate upon so initially needle was started as a in house division to make some sense out of this chaotic data framework which i was hurling towards but when i reflected upon uh, what was the issue is to build a proper system uh was not an in-house endeavor because we have seen that there is a massive unbundling of products small small products which are narrow productivity tools or narrow content sources are emerging and when you aggregate such large number of productivity tools uh, uh spread over cloud it is very impossible to build a modern workflow on top of it because fragmented data leads to fragmented processing leads to fragmented collaboration leads to frog- fragmented insights and leads to a very hard task of connecting the dots this continuous friction and productivity loss was the progeny of why the needle was born what needle is trying to do is it is trying to bring all your data such as email chats social media feeds blogs what not you have into a single cloud computing platform and apply 
uniform business logic on top of it what needle as far as to do is to free you from tyranny of data management choices and helps you focus i think so that's a stated goal of needle as of right now and let's see what happens you know i've been a user of uh, needle uh, for some time i completely agree with uh, the kind of things it helps me do right in terms of removing the noise aside and focusing on what's important as far as information flow is concerned and the ease of doing all that so thank you for creating this platform so we are nearing the end of the uh, interview kuntal bhai and i have uh, just three more questions uh, the first uh, reminded me or the first question is uh, uh, reminds me of what einstein i think supposedly said that the difference between uh, universe and human stupidity is that universe has its limits right so my question to you is i think like like all of us right have done like stupidities in our life so what's the most stupid thing that you've done in your life and also the best decision of your life and learnings from both the best career decision was you know trusting my own inner voice and entering the financial market though i was not equipped to and my entire ecosystem my friends family relatives all advised me again that valid reason to do so but i had my own and the fact that i chose my own and outcomes have been justified is a is, is a task well accomplished in a way i was following the japanese concept of ikigai which i was not aware of that time but uh, if you re- really look at uh, i was driven by what i loved i that forced me to get better at what uh, to get better at that vocation and obviously uh, financial services is something which world needs and world is ready to pay for so it just eventually worked out though i was not aware of that concept at that time but later on when i read the book i i felt happy that i practiced it in real life at that point of time what is the worst decision in life it's a very difficult question because um, i don't know where to start the amount of mistakes i have made in my life is staggering but when there is one common thread to it and if i were to risk my limb out i have erred on trusting people and i have not i have not taken adequate care in verifying and vetting them prior to trusting in them this has resulted into some uh, severe wasted time effort and emotional emo- involvement without getting desired outcomes the learning here is very clear one has to be very careful of whom you allow in your inner circle and you have to constantly promote and demote people in your life despite this there is a bundle of contradiction here is that anything worthwhile in you love want in your life love respect trust all those things first needs to be given before you can receive it so i am mindful that i will occasionally end up giving to people who don't deserve it or reciprocate it but i am now more cognizant of uh, what happens uh, on my relations that's right uh, what about the single best piece of advice you ever received and also the single worst piece of advice you ever received which in hindsight was a bad advice I think so the best piece of advice uh, has come from Charlie Munger when he said that before you desire uh, uh, whether you deserve you think of it all the time this will depersonalize a lot of problems in life such as disappointment failure so on and so forth because if you are honest to yourself uh, it will put the right perspective on your thinking the worst advice i've got was the common folklore in wall street which was you never bro- go broke for booking profits vishal uh, compounders which scale are rarity and if you apply this uh, constant booking of profit it leads to you missing out almost all the upside and i uh, and i i think so i i have suffered a lot uh, following this advice in my initial phase of life so uh, here's my closing question to you kundal bhai uh, everyone walks on their own journey of life and everyone must play their parts well but what according to you is a life well lived well uh, vishal there's a nice saying which puts it very well that purpose of life is life full of purpose and meaning to me it boils down to having a regret free life of following your own inner score card and personally to me a successful life means a i am financially independent to do what i want at any point of time and b i get to do uh, contribute meaningfully to society uh, which is in a way suitable to my personality traits also so i think so this boils down to the essence of life at this point of time Thanks Kuntal bhai I think you were doing a lot for the society anyways by sharing your learnings wisdom uh, with students with investors with everyone and special thanks to you for uh, being so patient in answering all my questions right uh, great insights for me as always talking to you uh, 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 I'm sure uh, the audience uh, is uh, going to receive uh, uh, 
a boatload of insights from what you've shared today so thank you so much for your time and uh, i look forward to interacting with you in person very soon vishal uh, i must congratulate you on the depth of research you have done on me as a person and also bringing out questions which uh, throws differential insight out because uh, i think so a quality of any interview or any answers is as good as the quality of question asked and uh, to that extent i think so you have done a fantastic job and it's my good luck that you have chosen to speak to me invite me on the show and more importantly ask me penetrating question this two hours uh, uh, was a teaching experience and a learning experience for me too so though i uh, though i spoke most i am carrying away more learning than i think so probably you have carried away no thanks kuntil bhai i think as as we were talking uh, in the interim about how the attention spans have shortened right and how the average uh, uh, view time for or average listening time for a or a, for a podcast uh, uh, even the 1% show is around 20 25 minutes but i'm sure uh, there is a big enough audience who uh, appreciates uh, right uh, free flowing thought right uh, the insights that someone has to share basically a gist of the entire lifetime of learning and that's the reason uh, i am i'm just humbled and honored to have you right as a as a guest on my show and thank you so much for agreeing to do this in the first place and uh, i look forward to talking to you very soon thank you good evening and goodbye vishal thank you